Hello and welcome to The Big Picture. I'm Tina Jha. Outgoing US President Donald Trump said on Thursday that there will be an orderly transfer of power to Joe Biden on the 20th of January. In a statement, he said that even though he totally disagrees with the outcome of the election, there will be an orderly transition of power. Now, his remarks came soon after a joint session of the US Congress formally certified the Electoral College victory of Joe Biden as the next US president and Kamala Harris as the vice president in the November 3rd election. The counting of Electoral College votes and its subsequent certification, although came after an ugly episode of violence inside the US Capitol, resulting in four deaths, wherein Capitol Hill was brought under a lockdown, lawmakers had to be taken to safe places, gunshots were fired inside the Congress, and also tear gas had to be used. World leaders condemned the unprecedented violence and called for a peaceful transition of power in America. So on this edition of The Big Picture, we will be talking about the transition of power in a democracy and why it's important for seamless functioning of a democratic nation as well. To discuss this, I have with me a panel of experts. It's my pleasure to welcome on the program today, Professor Harsh Vipand, Head Strategic Studies Program, ORF, former Ambassador Prabhu Dayal, and Mr. Pramit Pal Chaudhary, Foreign Affairs Editor, Hindustan Times. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture today. Ambassador, let me begin the program today with your reaction to what happened in the Washington DC on Wednesday and what it speaks about the transition of power in America. Well, Tita, first of all, thank you for having me on your show. I feel that uh, it was the saddest and uh, the darkest day in America for a long, long time. I haven't witnessed anything like this happening in that country, which is considered by many as the greatest democracy on earth. Yes. Uh, world leaders have come out in condemnation of the events. Our prime minister has also said that he was greatly distressed by what happened. Uh, of course, now Donald Trump has conceded defeat and it does seem that there will be an orderly transition to Joe Biden and that he will be taking over the reins of authority. But uh, the damage which has been done to America's image and to the democratic system there will take a long, long time to heal. The main reason for this is that uh, the racial divide has become deeper than ever. This divide has been festering for quite some time. And uh, the attack on the Capitol, where even the office of uh, Nancy Pelosi was rampaged, this sort of attack speaks volumes for the sort of violent activities which the white supremacist movement is prepared to indulge in. You know, they were carrying the Confederate flag, which shows that they are prepared to take on the authorities of the United States of America. They stand for white supremacy and everything that it connotes. Uh, I think, therefore, that uh, it will take a good deal of effort on the part of Joe Biden to heal these wounds, which have now surfaced in American society, and then come down to the greater business of uh, taking on the challenges like uh, coronavirus, uh, a slumping economy, and uh, international challenges such as those posed by Chinese expansionism. So I think that uh, while on the one hand, uh, the events which took place in Washington, D.C., have saddened everybody who is a well-wisher of America. On the other hand, uh, things could be put behind everybody, and uh, the United States' new administration, led by Joe Biden, can get on with the task of governing America and uh, playing a leadership role towards uh, various questions of a global nature. Mr. Chaudhary? Even though Donald Trump has now conceded defeat, but the damage has already been done, it, do you think it's too late, the remarks coming from him, too late, the damage to America, the world's uh, 
strongest and perhaps the oldest democracy, the damage has already been done? Well, this works on a number of levels. I think the first point is that, is American democracy itself in danger? No, the institutions of American democracy actually functioned well, despite having a president who tried his very level best to undermine them and to subvert the constitutional and electoral process. So Trump, as you may remember, after the election in November, began fighting on every possible front to try and get the results overturned. Uh, he launched 60, over 60 lawsuits in different courts, and every single one of them was turned down by the judges, including by judges he himself had chosen and appointed. All of them said they, these have absolutely no merit whatsoever. He then pressured states like Georgia, Pennsylvania, and so on to overturn the results by making, as we know now, private phone calls and public entreaties. None of the state governments backed down. All the electoral officers said, we stand by the results. Um, then his final stage of his final desperate attack was this attempt to stop the electoral college vote, which is the final formal action under the Constitution to choose the president of the United States uh, by calling upon effectively a mob attack. Uh, but more importantly, I'd also argue trying to get his vice president to to block the results, to block the vote, uh, trying to get his Republican Party, his senators, to to refuse to support the Electoral College vote, boycott it, or do something. All of them basically refused, except for a handful of the Republican senators and a few members of the House. Uh, but the vice president himself made it clear legally he would not do so. Uh, you saw the council, the legal counsel of the White House warning members of the staff in the White House if they supported Trump, they would face charges of treason and be arrested and tried accordingly. Um, you saw before this the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, General uh, Miller, I think it is, publicly warning every U.S. soldier that you take an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States, not to defend the President of the United States. You do not. You are... You take an oath for the Constitution, not for the president, um, making it clear that the U.S. military would not in any way support the president in his actions. So when this final mob attack, in many ways, I would argue, was an act of desperation on the part of President Trump. So the institutions of America held, uh, despite basically being under the worst attack they've been on from a president since the Watergate crisis of, uh, during Richard Nixon's time. However, the public, the international image of the United States has obviously been very badly damaged. Um, if you visited the Capitol or the White House in the past in Washington, uh, there have always been some demonstration going on someplace or another. But the police presence is almost minimal. It's just assumed that nobody would ever dare to storm the White House or go to the U.S. Capitol. You could walk personally, you would just, people could walk right up to the Capitol building onto the hill um, without anybody stopping you, um, with very minimal uh, police presence. Uh, it was all very considered a very self-disciplined structure. That image obviously had been very badly damaged, and the fact that the president himself, the president of America, personally was supporting and, 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 um, and abetting, if you wish, this, this attack uh, on his own governmental system uh, will... will is not something that America will recover from for a while. Those images will be there for years to come. Uh, and every time any U.S. government gives a lecture to some African or Latin American or any other country in the world about their political process, everybody will look back and say, hey, don't give us lectures. We saw what happened in your country. Definitely. Professor Pan, a peaceful transition of power, which is in a way affected by a fair and transparent election, is supposed to be the cornerstone of a democracy. Why is it that these very democratic norms have sort of taken a beating in a country that has for so long had an image of being a standard bearer of democracy in the world? Uh, see, as you said, uh, you know, for a, for a functioning democracy, for a mature democracy, uh, a peaceful transition of power is almost sine qua non uh, as far as uh, you know, democratic health is concerned. So clearly... Uh, for Mr. Trump to try to overturn, uh, you know, uh, uh, again, this election by by various means, as was uh, earlier being highlighted, was uh, was an attempt to uh, 
you know, make sure that his personal ambition gets the better, uh, you know, getting the better of him and making the institutional, uh, trying to make the institutional structures irrelevant. And this is this has been something that he had been trying to do throughout the last four years, where he did not bother to, uh, you know, uh, govern through the various structures and processes and institutions that are at the foundational uh, foundations of a, of a demo, uh, you know in a democracy he, he was clearly subverting them at every level uh, he was running the government by tweets he was uh, uh, you, you know uh, he was he did not bother he was not bothering to take into account uh, his cabinet uh, the way he was governing was was very chaotic so clearly you know in, in a sense uh, this was reflective of his personality the way he he thought that he was he's an you know he he's an outsider who's trying to uh, who has come to change the system and dismantle the system uh, from the very beginning this was the narrative that he that he came up with that i don't believe in the system because the system has created these problems and this is what happens when uh, you know the institutional fabric is repeatedly uh, challenged and to be you know uh, to be fair to both sides of the spectrum uh, there is also this question that many of his supporters have raised that look uh, you know russian collusion was talked about at the time donald trump was uh, was elected so why not this time why can't elections be problematic this time and this is something that he played on you know this yeah. this idea of 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 what happened before, you know, uh, in, in the last elections uh, and how the Democrats use that narrative, uh, to, you know, to marginalize uh, his support base. So clearly the polarization at the heart of this debate is very, very damaging. And that's why this transition of power and the way uh, it has happened uh, is, is very damaging to the body politic of America and, and especially to, the, to its image as an exemplar of global democracy. Uh, and that's what I think is going to take a very, very long time to heal. But now that he has said that transfer of power is imminent and that I'm going to go away, uh, you know, that transfer of power would be smooth on 20th January, I think the question would be, uh, whether for Mr. Trump, who still seeks a return to politics, by the way, you know, he wants to come back in 2024. I think that has become more difficult now, given the kind of, uh, you know, pushback that he's facing not only now from the Democrats, but also from the Republican Party, which would be very, very, you know, which would be, which would find it very difficult to accommodate his ambitions now that the, you know, that he has, you, with what has happened over the last 24 hours and how that has changed the complexion of American politics. But one thing I would also like to understand from you, Professor, is that Wednesday's incident in particular has brought to the fore the larger question, what led to this distrust in the democratic system of America? Donald Trump, we know he's been claiming a vote of fraud and his claims have been called outrageous as well. He's been criticized for not conceding defeat, which eventually he has now. But if we leave the individual aside and talk about the trust in the system at large, the question is, in an established democracy like America... What led to this distrust over the last few years? I think that's, you know, that's to, that to me is a fundamental question that Americans should be thinking more seriously about because it's not, it's not about Mr. Trump. Yes. Trump is a manifestation of this larger problem that you are that you are that underlining. And the problem is that, you know, this has been building up for some time. If you see his victory, uh, you know, over, over Hillary Clinton, it was reflective of this of this uh, insurrection kind of an attitude uh, in, in a large part of American populace that they don't believe in the system. And that's the most dangerous part that a large part of American electorate today believes that their system is fraudulent, that, 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 that their system is not working to their advantage. And I think that's where the challenge lies. How do you cultivate that uh, that that perception that this is a, this is a fair system it gives uh, you know it, it is it, it it gives you equal opportunity the, you know this this idea that in america everyone can be uh, can aspire to be the to the highest office in the land everyone can go there and be successful which is something still very attractive about america but increasingly that idea has come under question and that idea for many for many americans has come under question when you when you go to the hinterland in america which is the Republican, uh, you know, base, and where Trump drew much of his support. I think that is where the questions are being asked, and I think that is why you see Mr. Biden himself trying to incorporate a lot of Mr. Trump's ideas into his campaign. When Mr. Trump says uh, "Make America Great Again," Mr. Biden says "Make in America." So clearly, a lot of what uh, Mr. Trump was saying it still resonates with people. He has, you know, uh, if Mr. Biden uh, uh, has won this election, this it had not been a sweeping mandate for Mr. Biden as well. So clearly, by for Mr. Trump, there's this idea that he has been successful in ch challenging the fundamental assumptions of American politics, and you know, has been core to his 
uh, support base and has been uh, he he has been able to use that to mobilize the support base and even today when uh, when mr trump is losing left right and center the georgia elections are a case in point even then he could get people who could come in large numbers to his rallies tells you a different story about america that something something is going on in the societal landscape which i think uh, both sides uh, republicans and democrats need to recognize and need to do something about their institutional fabric because if the the the, the faith in the institutions goes down like the, like it has been happening over the last few years then i'm afraid this is this is not this is just the start this is just the beginning and it may it may very well continue for a very, for a long time ambassador let me bring that question to you if a lot of americans believe that the current system is fraudulent do you think it's time that america needs to move beyond that electoral college system to a more uniform and an independent system of elections which people trust well you know there is a lot that is wrong with the electoral college system and american political analysts also concede this fact for one thing uh this system of winner take all means that if in a particular state party a wins 51% and party b gets 49% then party a will take all the states from that state so in other words there is something inbuilt in the electoral college system which distorts the representation of votes which are given to a particular candidate there are also various other faults within this system however bringing about any change in the electoral college system is not going to be easy because it will require a major amendment to the us constitution and i think that the groundwork for that has not been done america is not yet ready for such a major overhaul uh, at the same time to come down to your question of uh, the sort of uh, misgivings which exist within american society what is it that is causing the divide uh, let me mention that uh, there are various reasons for this first of all there is this underlying issue relating to employment or rather unemployment uh, a large number of uh, white people in america feel that their jobs are being taken away there is no denying this fact during the four and a half years that i spent in new york as consul general many people had the audacity to say this to my face that indians are coming here and taking away our jobs uh, conversely there is a lot of resentment for manufacturing jobs being taken away by china companies from the united states locating manufacturing facilities away from the united states and in china and also to some extent in other places like mexico so there is rightly or wrongly a perception that american jobs are going to other people donald trump had promised to his voter base that he would bring back american jobs and he had given them that hope that america would do without outsourcing jobs or bringing in workers from other countries so that strengthened his particular voter base in that direction there is of course uh, a brimming issue of uh, racial division in any case within american society uh, black lives matter is a manifestation of the deeply held resentment within the uh, black community in the united states the white supremacist movement has been raising its ugly head from time to time in various parts of america so this racial question is also something that is beginning to uh, be a divisive force in america when uh, a political uh, party tries to gain voter support from a particular group of people naturally divisiveness grows and i think uh, also in done donald trump was responsible 
for fomenting racial disturbances. Uh, the uh, white supremacist movements that took place, sometimes they turned violent, but uh, rather than condemn them at any point, Donald Trump kept referring to them as very nice people. Perhaps these uh, were fact, issues that uh, resonated with people. Perhaps these were issues that his supporters really, really wanted to be raked up in the country. Uh, Mr. Chaudhary, coming back to the process of transition of power, how does presidential transition work in the United States? Um, well, the, 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 it seems, uh, I mean, it's pretty much as what as, as it's unrolling right now. You have an election, uh, that really, which is effectively 51 smaller elections taking place across all the states in Washington. That results in a set of so-called electors being chosen who vote on the basis of whoever won a majority, in most of the states anyway, a majority of the, the votes uh, cast. Um, we saw basically today, <clears throat> well, last night in America, that electoral college meeting and casting the votes, and in this case, obviously, Biden won. That is the really the last major constitutional step left to declare a president, and officially now Biden has become the next U.S. US president. And the final act, which is to some degree symbolic, is that he then takes the oath of office 14 days from now, and, and uh, at that point, uh, Trump officially ceases to be president of the United States. Um, and Trump has said he will leave, even if he had said that I would not leave the White House, automatically all the trappings of power would have disappeared. People would have no longer taken his phone calls. He would have been blocked from entering uh, the White House or other places. He would have been, oh, this, the nuclear arsenal button, everything would have been taken away from him. So automatically that would happen. Um, even if he were to try to resist uh, uh, changing, uh, handing over power to Biden. But as it is, it seems he will walk away. Um, and, uh, and then basically Biden, Biden is in charge. Uh, normally, uh, in the United States, you would have already had uh, a huge number of meetings being held between the various government departments and agencies. The new CIA team would be talking to the, the to the old one, the Defense Department. All the ministries would have begun the transition talks about handing over files, discussing what are the major topics to be concerned about, what are the dangers, threats, and so on. Uh, that's been a bit disrupted uh, because Trump has sort of switched that on and off, uh, depending on how much he he feels happy about uh, working with the Biden team. But I suspect over the next 14 days, you'll see a bit of an acceleration on that front. Uh, but that's, that's basically it. And that, um, you know, you are at that point, the president of America is now the present president. Uh, Trump is president only, only a name. Um, and, and the Biden administration can almost be said to have effectively begun. Uh, Professor, the transition period is supposed to promote an orderly transfer from the, old, or the outgoing president to the uh, incoming president. Now, if it doesn't serve the purpose that it's meant to, should this interval period be done away with and instead follow a system which other democracies follow? Uh, for example, uh, what, what's being done in India, where the transition of power has so far been quite prompt and harmonious without any hiccups? Uh, well, you know, there are pros and cons for both. And I think the American system has been, as Pramit pointed out, you know, when you when you have an outgoing president uh, and you have an incumbent, uh, the two teams uh, interact with each other. And there is a time that the time that is there between the uh, elections and the, you know, between the election night and the inauguration uh, in January uh, that that allows, uh, you know, the incoming uh, team to understand the issues, to understand the processes, uh, and to uh, make sure uh, the time is available to the to the president elect to uh, to have his own team in place, uh, you know, it, with with certain degree of deliberation. Uh, and uh, the the you know the top level cabinet, the top level um, postings uh, in in the in the bureaucracy, and they are all political positions in some ways in America, uh, unlike some in India, which where uh, the, the bureaucracy continues to run the country, uh, and the, the the power transition happens more. Seamlessly overnight. So I think uh, you know there are advantages of this, the, the of, of the of the processes that are in place in America. Uh, but certainly with, the, with with Trump, everything has been questioned. And so uh, you know, so one can look at the possibility that if this 
uh, this had not happened, what would have happened. But in this case in particular, uh, Tina, you have to go back and see that Mr. Trump was disputing the election right from the word go. So it was not as if he was willing to concede. Even if the transition, uh, I think if the transition were the next day, for example, we it took us a while to understand the election results, even in even this year. So, for example, we had we had to wait for um, eight to ten days before the uh, results were out uh, and and before the results were declared. And so clearly, the, the the questions I think about the efficacy of the result, and one can also look at the the Indian example uh, when Americans were voting for their president, I India was voting for in Bihar elections, and Bihar results were out much earlier. Uh, and uh, with a greater degree of accuracy, uh, the, the government was formed and the government was, you know, uh, is now well into its uh, second or third month. So clearly, I think the challenges for America are also more than just uh, trying to uh, look at the big, bigger issues. They're also about, uh, you know, how do you run these elections, which have become sort of a butt of ridicule uh, in, in, many, in many ways uh, around the world, uh, and especially in this year uh, or last year. Uh, so what we have what we have been witnessing from November till January, it has been one long drawn out process, which Mr. Trump exploited to his advantage uh, or rather disadvantage. And and I think what we have seen is uh, that American democracy has been, uh, you know, uh, has been looking rather shabby at the, at the end of that process. But there are bigger questions about electoral college reforms, questions about larger reforms in the system, which perhaps will need to be addressed as as. Uh, uh, as America looks forward in, in try, trying to rejuvenate uh, the, the fundamentals of their economic structure, of their, of their political structures, which I think uh, if, you, if you go by the media discussion, if you go by uh, the political discussion, that, uh, that is uh, very much the focal point of attention at the moment. Ambassador Dayal, one concluding remark from you on what America needs to do in terms of reforms so that the situation, the state that it is in currently doesn't happen in future as well? Well, Tina, Lord Acton had said, it is not the system, but who run the system that matter. The American system has generally functioned quite all right. It is only in this particular instance that we have noted this uh, glaring sort of uh, problem arising where the entire election process has been called into question and where the losing candidate, who is the sitting incumbent, is claiming that the election was stolen from him. So a lot has to do with the personality of President Trump, who is, I'm afraid, an egoist. And he is someone who cannot accept defeat. So it is not the system, but the people who are part of the system, who are running the system, who make all the difference. In this particular instance, as I said, it is the personality of President Trump which has created all the problems. He has incited people who are part of his voter base to be violent and to even go to the extent of rampaging the capital. I hope that the American system will be able to take care of all these problems. We are friends of America. India and America have a partnership. Good luck, America, is what I would say. Definitely. And both India and America, because they're established democracies, also have a high degree of responsibility in showcasing to the world, to the other countries, the merits of a democracy and also enhance it in parts of the globe as well. Thank you to all my guests once again for joining us on The Big Picture today and sharing your thoughts on the subject as well. Pleasure having you on the program. So that's it from us on this edition of the program. We'll see you again tomorrow with another topic and a different set of panelists as well. Just in case you missed the television broadcast, let me remind you, you can also watch our program on YouTube and you can send in your feedback and suggestions as well. See you again. Thank you very much for your time.